So, Dr. Abra, lovely having you here. Good evening, everybody. We have Dr. Abra Chandra Chaudhary as our next guest. He's a rheumatologist and he's from Calcutta. Extreme pleasure from our side to welcome you to India's first metabolic health conference. Uh, welcome, Dr. Abra, once again. Yeah, good evening to everyone. And thanks to the entire DLive community uh, for inviting me to this. It's entire is uh, a pleasure to be part of this conference. Our pleasure. So, Dr. Abra, I think I've known you for a little while. Uh, I'll just also give the audience a little bit of introduction about you. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary is a rheumatologist. He's practicing in Kolkata. And uh, he has done his DNB medicine from the prestigious institute, Christian Medical College, Velo, which we from the South, I'm from Chennai, so... I, we all know it as the CMC Velour. CMC Velour is very popular for its rheumatology department and it gets many patients from the Northeast India and many neighboring countries as well. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary received a prestigious fellowship from Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology. He was one of the very few Indians who received this fellowship. And uh, after he finished his studies, he came back to India and chose to practice in Bengal. And he's considered to be one of the best rheumatologists in Kolkata. Welcome again, doctor. So uh, my first question to you is, we would like to actually know how you got connected to low carb from a, as a mainstream doctor. How is it that you... Like, uh, identified low carb, practiced it, and started believing in it. So my first exposure to the low carb community was in like 2014 and 15, while I was doing my uh, rheumatology post graduation, super specialization at Lucknow. So there is a Facebook group called Ankylosing Spondylitis India, and many of the I was member of the group as a doctor, and many of the patients uh, followed uh, what is what they call a low starch diet. And many people said that they their medication requirement uh, went down. They can some of them could get even off medications while they were following this low starch diet. So low starch diet is almost similar to the low carb diet. So that was my first exposure. But after that, I did not go further much into that. And then next in two thousand twenty one, um. I was gaining weight and my waist size was increasing. Like uh, every now and then my I had to change my trousers. So that was really, really awkward. So I started with a waist size of 34 and a weight of 68 kilo. So one of my friends, he's a low carb practitioner in Calcutta. So I was already quite a bit of low carb. So I uh, fully went into no carbs and started intermittent fasting. So like 15 days of fasting, nothing much moved. Um, one or two kilos then straight away i jumped to omad so 23 hours of fasting uh, one day i had a difficulty and i, I was also doing quite uh, high intensity exercises also that time so i took a little bit of salt and everything normalized so for the next four months uh, it was like omad with um, complete no carb and i like fasted uh, we used to track fasting through the zero app and my maximum fasting record was 42 hours. Wow. So in four months, I came down from 68 to 56. My waist size came down from 34 to 28 size. And 28 size was the first time in my life that I brought a jeans for 28 size. So that was the first time. And that motivated me that uh, all those uh, clothes and all that uh, I couldn't wear, that I couldn't even dream of uh, wearing. I could wear them. And after that, next uh, two years, I've been mostly into low carb. So with intermittent of carbs, like in some festivals or birthday celebrations or something like that. But mostly it has been based on a high protein diet. And uh, with uh, uh, fasting, I fast for almost 16 to 23 hours every day. With intermittently, even nowadays also, Monthly, I fast for one day, 35 to 37 hours. It's day before yesterday also. It was 37 hours of fasting to compensate for the pujas. Oh, so, that's brilliant. <laughs> so I do cheat, but I compensate by fasting. And mostly yeah. it is almost 25, 26 days. It's a, a low carb 
low carb and high protein. So that's how I am into low carb. And after that, I have pushed my patients. Most of my patients uh, knows that uh, we need to lose weight. If you are coming to this doctor, the talking with my patients is mostly about uh, diet rather than their disease. That's very interesting because um, I, I, I mean, we did work on a couple of cases and I yeah. remember the uh, person who had referred to me was mentioning very firmly every single time I would talk, he, Dr. Abhya was ne bola hai fasting, karna hai. Dr. Abhya has told me to fast and he's so impressed because you are setting the exact example that you're talking about. So brilliant, very nice to hear this Dr. Abhya. Now, um, moving on to a very important number that I want to share over here as well. So we've been talking about diabetes, which is like uh, 103 million plus and so on for the Indian statistics. But I think another very uh, staggering number is also on arthritis, specifically osteoarthritis, because yes. uh, I think uh, in 2019, or that must have been the latest study, it mentioned there are close to 63 million Indians who, you know, have been diagnosed with osteoarthritis, right? Um, so this is becoming a very critical condition now. And it's this is also stated as more women being affected than yeah. men. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so can you shed some light on why this is, number is so staggering and it's, it's going pretty high pretty fast? So basically, if we um, deal with the different types of arthritis, uh, we see one is a inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and another is a non-inflammatory arthritis, which is called which you call as degenerative arthritis. So osteoarthritis belongs to the group of degenerative arthritis. So for uh, inflammatory arthritis, we have good medications, but for osteoarthritis, as of now, there is no proven medications. So the only thing that can uh, work in osteoarthritis is lifestyle change. Now, what is uh, the problem that I'm finding in India is uh, twofold. One is definitely obesity and the other is sarcopenia. So Indians are grossly sarcopenic. So there are many people who buy the, if you see the weight, they are normal weight, but they are visibly obese. So we do not take this uh, normal weight obesity into consideration. So if he, people are only after the weight, but they do not increase their muscle power. So combining this to the sarcopenia and the obesity, um, this uh, osteoarthritis is coming uh, and because it has no uh, medicines for it. So that is why it is uh, uh, coming up as a huge number. And women are, so some of the diseases are more prone in women. So like women have more uh, adipose tissue. So maybe that may be one of the reasons that women suffer more osteoarthritis and the way we like uh, women in India still do more of household work. So the way they sit, the way they practice sitting cross leg positions of deflection, maybe that may be some of the reasons that women are getting more affected with osteoarthritis. Uh, so do you think this has got any connection with the kind of food and lifestyle that people are having these days? See, if you take obesity, yes, definitely, because uh, as uh, people are more and more obese, so people are likely to get uh, a mechanical um, overload on their knee joints. So that is why the lifestyle definitely plays a very important role. Right. Yeah. So um, in terms of you, you also mentioned something about inflammation, right? Yeah. Um, so do you see any connection in between some of these high carbohydrate foods that we've all been talking about all through the day, like most like, mostly sugar, ultra processed foods, or wheat consumption, do do they kind of have any connection with inflammation? Do these uh, food products aggravate arthritis, or do they cause more pains? Do they inflame the joints all the more? Yeah, obviously, like uh, there is a great deal of relation between like, uh, so these products are related to insulin resistance and obesity. And if you see the biology of the adipose tissue, so in most of the rheumatologic diseases, uh, these are mediated by something called as cytokines. These are something like hormones. So one of the important cytokines is uh, TNF or tumor necrosis factor. And there is another cytokine called interleukin-6. So the therapies are directed against these cytokines. 
So the source of this cytokines is adipose tissue. So adipose tissue uh, produces uh, TNF, adipose tissue produces interleukin-6, which mediates inflammation. So inflammation is multifold. So on one aspect, this can cause inflammation of the joints and it can also cause inflammation of other body parts. So that is how the more processed food will cause more of uh, insulin resistance, more of adipose tissue, more of obesity, and in turn will promote inflammation. So the by reducing the amount of adipose tissue, we definitely can reduce the amount of inflammation um, that this uh, foods can cause. And even like um, if you mention osteoarthritis, so osteoarthritis, although it is called as a degenerative disease, so people get a biomechanical benefit by redu reduction of the weight. But uh, there are a lot, some of the studies have also shown that there it is not a purely non-inflammatory disease. There is some degree of inflammation, not as much as in the other inflammatory diseases, arthritis, is, but uh, uh, there are certain papers which have shown that a ketogenic diet has improved the inflammation in osteoarthritis. So, so the benefits of this diet in even in osteoarthritis is multifold by weight reduction and also by reduction of the inflammation. All right. That's nice. So, uh, so do I understand that, uh, you know, when I was reading up on uh, rheumatology arthritis, I, I got to understand there are 100 different types of arthritis. Yeah, that yeah. is a staggering number, whereas we lay people only know a few. And I think some of them are pretty severe as well. Something like rheumatoid arthritis is autoimmune. And then you have a couple of other severe cases like thoracic arthritis or gout. So yeah. that's does a low carb approach help even in these kind of conditions? Yeah, obviously. Like, uh, if you take, uh, I'll just give a uh, introduction into the autoimmune disease. So, autoimmune disease, what people think that the arthritis affects only joints. So, arthritis doesn't affect only joints; it can affect any virtually any organ. So, rheumatoid arthritis can start with joint. It can affect the lungs. It can affect the eyes, and there are other severe autoimmune diseases like the lupus or like Sjogren syndrome or like scleroderma. So this can affect uh, almost the whole body. And these kind of arthritis, uh, these uh, diseases, autoimmune disease, uh, the young people like 15 to 40 is the uh, age group for autoimmune disease, unlike what people think that it is the elderly who gets affected. Even kids can get, get uh, affected with autoimmune diseases. So uh, that's about autoimmune diseases. And as I mentioned, that uh, the mediator of autoimmune disease is cytokines and low carb diet reduces the amount of cytokine production, which we are also doing by the medicines that we use. We have a very special group of medicines, uh, monoclonal antibodies targeted against this tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. So people who does a low carb diet, they're... Uh, the cytokine level goes down and many of my patients who are following low carb diet have observed that they could decrease the amount of medications they needed before the low, they were doing this low carb approach. The number of medications definitely comes down. It's not that everyone go, can go off medications, but definitely the medication requirement definitely comes down. And the apart from the medication, the benefit that they get is from the weight reduction. Because uh, overloading the joints will always be a problem for them. Their disease can be in remission, but uh, obesity will cause overload on the knees, uh, for which uh, medicines are not going to take care of that. So low-carb diet definitely helps in that aspect. Definitely interesting to know because uh, I think we've always associated osteoarthritis with obese people. And we've felt that rheumatoid arthritis is like, a genetic condition or it could be just has been there for years and nothing can be done about it um so i think your point really makes a lot of sense to you know for even those who have rheumatoid arthritis because i've worked with a couple of them and i've seen that their pain centers become really bad as time progresses and during colder season it becomes yeah. too painful for them and uh, i think uh, i worked with a couple of uh, them and they found just like how you said that uh, they did feel that relief. So one other question is very curious to me is uh, I think you from Bengal and me from South, we share a little same cuisine in terms of rice being the favorite. Yeah, yeah. So how do you educate? How do you uh, 
teach your patients to adopt or what what is it that you tell your patients to adopt and what is their you know push back when you say you can't be eating so much of rice so like it's a bargain so i start with get off all uh, so many people there are many people in bengal who it's uh, three course of rice the morning yeah. starts with puff rice and afternoon is afternoon and night is rice so it's like a kind of uh, bargain in a fish market so it starts with you uh, you get uh, all three meals of rice and maybe we'll settle down at one meal at rice so um, on maybe in the first visit i counsel them that at least breakfast you stop eating rice and you take some protein eggs and next visit i counsel them so maybe in dinner you can skip rice so it's a bargain sort of thing how much we can win so people when the thing is when people start noticing the change they are willing they are more willing to uh, adopt to the new lifestyle because people find it like uh, they're mo much more energetic uh, and some of the cases of osteoarthritis severe osteoarthritis who are not willing for a knee replacement so when they lose and the medical community what they have to offer is a knee replacement so when they um after say 2 3 months uh, when they see feel that they are feeling very light and although the knees are still the same but they are still able to walk they are much more energetic they are much more willing to adopt this lifestyle and we can push them a little more so that's how it works uh besides you mentioned these knee replacement surgeries which i think are becoming more common these days you know it's, it's rising actually people are opting for a lot of replacement surgeries now as a doctor i'd like to know from your side um is it is what are the side effects that someone needs to be aware of before just jumping into a surgical surgical intervention before trying a lifestyle intervention uh see a uh, surgical intervention is not um, is definitely not a emergency intervention a knee replacement surgery is not a emergency like a gallbladder or appendectomy so it can always be planned so the uh, success of a knee replacement surgery doesn't um, de depends on multiple factors number one is definitely obesity and number two most important is the muscle strength how much muscle strength you have before the surgery so most indians do not have adequate muscle strength the amount of exercise that they do is not uh, is far from adequate to increase the muscle strength so there are some people who definitely need especially when their knees gets uh, bent so uh, in those case surgery definitely gives them a new life people who become bedridden or like who become very depressed because they a person who was uh, totally independent suddenly over the years becomes totally dependent on their household members for every kind of help so knee replacement surgery is definitely good but then what i tell my patients that prepare your body for the surgery for 6 months and uh, if you are not willing for a knee replacement surgery yes lifestyle change is the only way that uh, can be done but if you are willing for a knee replacement surgery then uh, go go ahead with that but prepare your body take 6 months do lifestyle change and then go ahead with the surgery you will get a new life with that so that is uh, how i counsel my patients i think even after a surgery following a healthier lifestyle and eating yeah, healthy food is definitely a must isn't absolutely. it absolutely so a, a surgery doesn't mean that surgery takes away the pain and the way you walk it does nothing to the muscles and it does, so even after surgery you need to strengthen your muscles and you need to uh, lose weight the very uh, reason for which uh, you underwent the knee replacement surgery and not only knee replacement surgery i have seen patients who have had bariatric surgeries and again who had gained weight because they didn't follow a lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, same thing happened following bariatric surgery so a surgery doesn't mean a surgery gets definitely gives really gives a good quality of life and they uh, get rid of the pain but still they need to uh, follow a, a lifestyle measures so doctor in your uh, different cases that you've handled so far can you share any unique uh, case that has you know really changed uh, with an intervention a lifestyle intervention specifically a low carb intervention and what you follow low carb plus is 
so like uh, i'd like to mention one or two cases so one um, so uh, you have heard of psoriatic arthritis so yeah. psoriasis as a, uh, so different uh, arthritis are related with uh, metabolic problems but among them psoriatic arthritis has the largest amount of metabolic problems so a patient who has even uh, skin psoriasis uh, they can have a, a fatty liver, uh, dyslipidemia, their risk of cardiovascular disease is hugely increased as compared to the other types of arthritis. So I had one patient, so we use a medicine called methotrexate for uh, different kinds of arthritis. So uh, one of my patients, he uh, was obese, he had fatty liver and nobody could ever give him methotrexate because every time met methotrexate was given on the setting of a fatty liver, his... Uh, SGOT, SGPT levels would go up. So I advised him to go for a low-carb lifestyle and he diligently followed. And after that, we introduced methotrexate. So it has been like two years. He has been on methotrexate and he, st he still is on low-carb and he does good amount of weight training. His SGPT liver enzymes has never gone up till that. He's still on methotrexate and his medications have come down to a significant extent in the last two, three years. And he's doing absolutely fine. So that is one aspect. Then uh, uh, again, gout is another aspect that uh, people have a lot of uh, myths. So uh, the, what the mainstream uh, uh, doctor suggests that you should be off all proteins. So I have had, uh, so I work uh, with a lot of patients in the Northeast from Darjeeling, Kalimpong, Kashyong, Sikkim side. So it's a myth among them that they consume a lot of pork and they consume a lot of red meat. So they have a myth that consuming a lot of red meat causes gout. Initially, I also used to believe those kind of things. But then I found out that they also consume a lot of carbs and they consume a lot of tubers. So the vegetables uh, that they take consume a lot of potato and they have like tapioca and they have almost three courses of rice, rice and noodles and all these things. If you go to any mountain, the standard meal is, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, is noodles and right. and all these things. So nobody has ever analyzed that whether it's the red meat because nobody consumes only red meat or they always consume with a good amount of rice. So some of my patients and gout, uh, severe gout can cause a chronic kidney disease. So some of my patients who already had established kidney disease, I have put them on low carb and with increase, they I have advised them to take red meat and eggs and most of which their um, nephrologist had advised them not to take. But they are taking this without, they have had no gout flares and they are doing pretty well. So some of them has been off medicines and some of them we have been able to uh, decrease the amount of attack that they have. So these are some of the cases and even in angst bond also I have had um, patients, uh, one of my patients is a member, is a trainee in D-Life community. So she had underwent this journey, her disease uh, is much better now, she has lost a significant amount of weight and then she chose to be one of part of the nutrition community as well. That's interesting. I think uh, this the, the answer to the previous question where you clarified a lot of things on gout makes so much of sense because we've had so many people come up and question us, uh, you know, saying that meat, uh, I've got gout problem, we've got uh, high uric acid. So meat is the first thing that has to go or any protein is the first thing that has to show off. And uh, I think your answer and your view really clarifies that. Uh, so I think uh, and one thing I'd like to mention that a uh, lot of the patients actually do not have gout they have what we call as asymptomatic hyperuricemia so most of the patients who have metabolic syndrome who are obese have their raised uric acid levels and in India many of these patients who do not have gout are treated as gout just based on their raised uric acid levels so maybe a patient with rheumatoid arthritis has raised uric acid levels they are often labeled as gout but that is often not the case. And people need not be on medicines for these uh, people who do not have gout. And uh, what I read from like, uh, if you go to Dr. Jason Fung's, uh, the diet doctor website, I was even today I was reading. So when you go on a low carb diet, transiently, there may be increase in the uric acid levels. So for six weeks, the uric acid levels may go up, but there is no gout flare. 
So recently, again, one of my patients I have been following up with Dave. They also had the under, um, same thing. The uric acid levels when before the low carb was around 8. Following the low carb, it was 10. But they didn't have any further attack. So after maybe 6 to 8 weeks, the uric acid level comes down. and But they do not have any attack. So they are on fully on protein-based diet. And um, I've in fact talked with uh, one of the experts in uh, uric acid from UK. What he uh, said that they have put uh, patients on low purine diet and they have said that they have uh, seen that it reduces uric acid by only one milligram. So even people on low purine diet. So it's uh, uh, overall lifestyle measures like weight loss and uh, improving your exercises that uh, improves your gout attacks, not only going on low protein diet. Wow. I, yeah, like I said, I just clarified so much for us in terms of uric acid and gout, which is always the question that, you know, pushback that you get when you have high uric acid, completely cut off proteins, don't touch meat and all of that. So I think yours brings so much of clarity. So uh, we just have a couple of more minutes left, doctor. So if there's a message you would like to share with the mass and with our viewers out there uh, viewing our video right now, what is it that you would like to really share across to them? So, like, um, as you said, like, uh, the incidence of arthritis is definitely increasing. And um, India suffers from mainly two problems, obesity and sarcopenia. So, we need to work on both the fronts. We need to uh, reduce the obesity by following our low-carb approach and with intermittent fasting. And, um, um, like, we can um, bargain with the people as to how much uh, strict they can follow. But sarcopenia is... Again, another problem that is prevalent with Indians and Indians are like uh, more with yoga and they are not open up to weight training as of yet. So weight training also needs to come up uh, in a big way if the metabolic health has to improve. Those are lovely points, doctor. It was such a pleasure talking to you and we're so happy you were able to make it to our event. I'll uh, hand it over to Shashi. But before I give it over to Sashi, I should uh, also tell Sashi that uh, doctors, one of the patients of doctor is currently enrolled into our program and uh, she's doing really well. So uh, doctor's always been referring to the life videos for reference to his patients. So I think that's a huge vote of confidence that we have from his side. Over to you, yeah, I think when we were there interacting in the lounge, so doctors informed me. And I wanted to, first of all, thank Dr. Abro for accepting this invite, coming and sharing his knowledge and wisdom on low carb. And uh, when we were formulating this session, Anjali told me that he she wanted you in this. And we immediately shortlisted you and, and then we got back. And then she got back with the date and timing. And we are so happy that you could come. And specifically on this day and today, we had a lot of Indian doctors of varied specialties, endo, cardiologists, orthopedicians, surgeons coming in and telling about their experience. So thank you very much. And we look forward for more extended sessions with you so that we can have more knowledge on this. Thank you so thank much you so thank for you. giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Andrew. you so much. Thank you. thank you, Anjali, for hosting last two thank sessions. You. Nice. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.